Well, good morning. How's everybody? I hope you're doing well. I am so thankful to be here with you today. If you don't know me, my name is Elliot. I'm the lead pastor here at The Cove, and I want to take a second and welcome you here, whether you're with us in the room right now. We're in the Kentucky shirt. I love it. Fantastic. Um, yeah, I know there's good people here. The presence of the Lord is in this place, you know? So, yeah. yeah. Whether you're with us in the room right now or whether you're joining us live on the stream, we're glad that you're with us as we get ready to open up the Word of God together. We're continuing on in our series at the greatest month of generosity ever, and I can't wait to share with you what God's been working on in my life. But let's pray together, and we'll jump in. Father, thank you so much for today. Thank you for the chance to be here in this place, in your presence, God. Thank you for what you've already done. And God, right now, I ask that you uh, help me to get out of your way, and that your spirit would fill this place, that you speak to each and every one of us, Father. We ask that you receive all the glory and all the praise, for you are worthy, as we just sang. It's in Jesus' precious name we pray, amen. So, you all know Thanksgiving's in a couple days, right? I'm not surprising anybody when I say this. You're welcome, for those of you who needed the reminder, Okay. It's going to be fantastic. Looking forward to it. I want to ask you as we, um, not, I don't want to just skip over Thanksgiving, but I do. There is a question I need to ask. Have you started buying Christmas presents yet? Did you? A couple of you are like, yes, absolutely. And the rest of you are looking at me horrified right now. It's coming. It's coming quickly. And here's the thing. Last year, about this time, we sat down with our kids and we had a conversation with them. We gave them a choice. We said, okay, here's the thing. We can buy you some plastic stuff and put it on the tree, and that's, that's fine if you want to do that. Um, but if, if you'd rather not do that, then what we can do is we'll do annual passes to Universal Studios in Orlando. We're not doing both, okay? So the choice is yours. You can have Christmas presents under the tree on Christmas Day or Universal. And understand that if you choose Universal, there won't be anything under the tree, okay? You need to understand that. And... Um, Here's the thing. I know that I'm raising smart kids because they didn't even blink. They're like, yeah, we're going to Orlando. That sounds fantastic. And, and so we've done that. And I'll tell you something, parents, you know this already. Those passes cost me a lot more money than, than the plastic stuff that we were going to put under the tree. But maybe, maybe you have the same experience that I have over the years. That most of the toys that we bought, they get played with for how long? 10 minutes? I was going to say 45. I'm generous, I guess. I don't know. About 45 minutes. And then they become a tripping hazard until we re-gift them to the younger cousins or they find their way to Goodwill. At one time, a couple months ago, I guess, I tried to calculate how much of my money Universal Studios has received this year. And that number is way too embarrassing to say out loud, okay? So it was crazy. I stopped counting, if I'm just being honest with you. But I'll tell you this. I'll tell you this, the memories that we've made are priceless. The pictures, the one-on-one -on -one trips, the, the family days to just get out of town and get away from everything, we wouldn't trade that for the world. And I read recently as I was preparing to chat with you about this that, man, raising kids is expensive, amen? Yeah. Um, raising a child right now in the United States costs about 16 grand a year. I got three of them suckers, okay? Like, listen, we're not even talking about Universal right now. $16,000 a year. And, and one of the things that we, that we do at our house is the kids, they do chores and then they get paid. And if they don't do their chores, they don't get paid. You understand? So they're, under, they're starting to understand a little bit about what things cost because they got to buy some of their own stuff. And so every once in a while, we'll be somewhere and, and one of the kids will look at me and say, Dad, you really don't have to spend that much money on me right now. And then I just melt into the concrete, you understand? And, but I always respond the same way. I'll say, listen, don't you worry about it. Mommy and daddy love you. Let me worry about the finances right now. It'll, it'll be okay. I love you. Because, you know, we're not sitting around trying to be stingy and counting every, every penny that we spend on the kids to hold that against them. Yeah, we, I told you last week, we budget down to the penny. We do. But we don't hold the money that we spend on the kids against them, do we? Did you? I bet you didn't. How come? How come you didn't do that? Well, it's because you provide for them, not out of obligation, but you provide for them, not out of duty, but out of what? 
out of love. And giving to our kids is easy most of the time. Most of the time. Because they're grateful most of the time. So it's easy to give to them. But giving to other people is different, isn't it? Giving to other people is different because we don't have the same relational investment in other people that we have in our kids. We, I, I wouldn't go so far to say that we don't love them, but we certainly don't love them the same way. Fair? We don't love them the same way. And I wouldn't classify most of us as selfish, and we would certainly not say that about ourselves. We say, well, I'm not selfish. I got real strong boundaries, though. You know what I'm saying? I'm not selfish, but my boundaries are rock solid. And we should have healthy boundaries in our lives. We should. Otherwise, we end up in a giant mess pretty quickly. But I, I'll, I'll say this. Most of us, we love people right up to the point where it starts to cost us. We love people right up to the point where it starts to hurt. And then we start evaluating how much are we really supposed to give? Like, where's the line where it's like, yeah, that's, that's, that's good. It's interesting because we do that. And at the same time, we're all chasing love, aren't we? We're chasing love. And our culture tells us that that's the highest ideal is to love and be loved. And it might be one of the rare things that they're not 100% wrong about, yeah? Because, you know, I read in uh, Corinthians 13, maybe you read that too one time, that love is, is greater than faith and hope. You remember that? It's probably the last time you heard it was the last wedding you went to. But at the very end, what did it say? And now these three things remain, faith, hope, and love. And the greatest of these is, is love. And we love that verse. It's beautiful. But what we don't want to admit is that love costs, doesn't it? Love costs. And it costs every time. Love and generosity are inextricably tied together. You cannot separate them. Love costs us. Yeah, it costs us money, but it costs a whole lot more in money, doesn't it? It costs a whole lot more. And in Luke chapter 10, Jesus is having a conversation with a man about what it takes to inherit eternal life. He said, teacher, what, how do I inherit eternal life? And then in summary, what Jesus said to him is love God and love your neighbors. You remember this conversation? Love God, love your neighbors. But the man, he wasn't satisfied with that answer. So you remember what he asked? What's the follow-up? He said, who's my neighbor? Who's my neighbor? And then Jesus launches into one of his most famous parables, one of his most famous teachings. We find it in Luke chapter 10. We're going to begin in verse 30. If you have your Bible, go ahead and open it up to Luke chapter 10, beginning in verse 30. And if you're following along in the YouVersion Bible app, you can hit the live event tab and, and find it there as well. Luke chapter 10, beginning in verse 30. Here's what it says. In reply, Jesus said, a man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho when he was attacked by robbers. They stripped him of his clothes. They beat him and went away, leaving him half dead. A priest happened to be going down the same road. And when he saw the man, he passed by on the other side. So too, a Levite, when he came to the place and saw him, pass by on the other side. But a Samaritan, as he traveled, came where the man was. When he saw him, he took pity on him. He went to him and bandaged his wounds, pouring on oil and wine. Then he put the man back on his own donkey, brought him to an inn, and took care of him. The next day, he took out two denarii and gave them to the innkeeper. Look after him, he said. And when I return, I will reimburse you for any extra expense you may have. Now, I know I've spoken to you before about the Connect Leadership Network, which is a group of pastors from all over the country. I meet with them every Wednesday morning on Zoom. We talk about all kinds of things. We pray for you. We talk about what God's doing in our lives and what he's doing in the church and try to sharpen one another. And one time we were talking about this parable, specifically as it relates to generosity. And we, we got going on this whole idea of mindset. And in this parable, we see three different mindsets. First, we, we see the robbers and their mindset. And in summary, their mindset was, what's yours is mine and I'm going to take it. What's yours is mine and I'm going to take it. So they do. They see a man traveling down the road. They 
beat him within an inch of his life, and they leave him for dead. It's a nightmare scenario for this guy. But to his great fortune, some religious leaders come by, a priest, and then a little bit later, a Levite come by. At least you would think that this is like best case scenario for this guy, right? Because surely the priest and the Levite are going to help this guy. But unfortunately, these two religious leaders, they had identical mindsets. And their mindset was, what's mine is mine and I'm going to keep it. What's mine is mine and I'm going to keep it. So what do they do? They moved to the other side of the road. And at best they said, man, I hope that guy don't die. I hope somebody helps him. But it's not going to be me. What's mine is mine. And I'm going to keep it. They avoided this guy entirely. Then along came a Samaritan. And we've gone into great detail in the past here about the relationship between Jews and Samaritans. It was not good. Jews hated Samaritans. And I know that's a strong word. It's the right word, though. They hated Samaritans. The people hearing Jesus' parable that day, not if you gave them 10 million guesses would they have thought that the Samaritan is going to be the hero of the story. But that's exactly how Jesus chooses to teach them about having the right mindset. The mindset of the Samaritan is what's mine is yours and I'm going to give it. What's mine is yours and I'm going to give it. Now, most of the time, when we think about generosity, we think about money. And that's fair. The good Samaritan did spend some money on this guy. He brought him to an inn, paid for his expenses, said, if, you, if that's not enough, let me know. I'll be back in a little bit. But he did a whole lot more than give money, didn't he? That was definitely not the extent. Because how many of you know, not all problems can be solved by throwing money at them. Not all problems can be solved that way. Well, if he had just walked by, the guy's bleeding out on the side of the road, drops a couple of 20s and said, best of luck. That's not, that's not actually what this guy needed. He's bleeding on the side of the road. He needed time. He needed attention. He needed medical help. He needed a ride. He needed food. And yeah, he was going to need some money to pay for these expenses because everything he had had just been taken away from him. And the good Samaritan as he's come to be known, supplied every one of those things. So the passage of scripture in Luke 10, if you still have it open, it concludes this way. Jesus asks, which of these three do you think was a neighbor to the man who fell into the hands of robbers? The expert in the law replied, the one who had mercy on him. At least that's how I imagine he said it. The one who had mercy on him. Jesus told him, go and do likewise. You know, this expert in the law couldn't even bring himself to say the Samaritan was the hero. Kind of just one who had mercy on him. That's not really the point, but it's, it's interesting. The Samaritan had mercy on this poor guy. You might say that the Samaritan loved him well. Fair? The Samaritan loved him well. Theologian Walter Liefeld describes the power of of this story this way. He said, love is demonstrated in action. And in this case, an act of mercy, it may be costly, cloth, wine, oil, transportation, money, and sacrifice of time. Anybody remember the question that kicked off this whole conversation? What did the expert in the law, what did he want to know? He said, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Yeah? What must I do to inherit eternal life? And the answer was love God and love your neighbor as yourself. Now, you take pretty good care of yourself, don't you? At least most of the time you do. You take good care of yourself. You make sure that you have what you need. Jesus knew that. And he said, now, go do the same for other people. Love them well. Be generous. And I want to make a distinction here before we move forward. Because I said a minute ago that not every problem can be solved by just throwing money on the pile. That's true. And in his book, Love Better, Aaron Chambers talks about this. He says it this way. He said, loving better isn't just about what we give. Paul taught that if I give away all I have, and if I deliver up my body to be burned, but I have not what? Love. But I have not love, I gain nothing. 
I can give it all away. But if I don't have love, I gain nothing. Here's what I know. You can give without loving, but you can't love without giving, can you? You can give without loving, but you cannot love without giving. And I want you to notice something. Jesus' instruction to this expert in the law was not to give, was it? What was it? It wasn't to give. It was to love. But love costs us, doesn't it? It costs us a lot. It costs us every time. It might cost us money, but it's certainly going to cost us a lot more than that. Tell me I'm wrong. The people that you love, they get your time, they get your attention, they get your service, and they get your money too. You have prayed with them, you have cried with them, you have laughed with them, you have served with them, you have killed time with them, you have traveled with them, you fought with them, you fought for them, and you wouldn't hesitate to spend money on them either, would you? You wouldn't. Why? Because you love them. Because you love them. This is true of every human on the planet. Always has been. And this, my friends, is exactly what Jesus is calling you to do. This is exactly what Jesus is asking of you. He wants you to be generous. But remember, we've defined it all month long. That generosity is an overflow of love and goodness that comes from a grateful heart and a desire to be like God. Jesus knows if you love, you will be generous. But if you just try to be generous, it won't last, will it? If you love, you will be generous. But if you just try to be generous, it won't last. You know why? Because your heart sets your heading, doesn't it? Your heart sets your heading. It's your mindset that determines your direction. It was true of the robbers. They said, what's yours is mine. I'm going to take it. And then they acted on it. It's true of the religious leaders. They said, what's mine is mine, and I'm going to keep it. And they acted on it. It was true of the Samaritan who said, what's mine is yours, and I'm going to give it. And he acted on it. It's true for you as well. Your heart sets your heading. Your mindset will determine your direction. The truth is that the robbers and the religious leaders, if we boil it all the way down, the truth is that they love themselves more than they love this guy on the side of the road, didn't they? And that's why they acted the way that they did. Yeah, I mean, I understand. They had vastly different reactions. Their actions were vastly different. But at the end of the day, when we boil it all the way down, neither one of them were loving people the way that Jesus was asking them to love them, were they? They weren't. Neither one of them, in their actions, reflected a loving heart. The Samaritan's love and his compassion saved this guy's life. So let me ask you this. Do you love people the way Jesus wants you to? You love people the way God wants you to love them? Let me ask it another way. Are you generous with yourself? And when I say that, I don't mean are you generous? Do you give yourself things? You understand? Are you generous with yourself? Are you giving of yourself? And the truth is, every one of us can work on this, myself certainly included. We can all work on that because we all have different areas of our life where we struggle with generosity, don't we? And maybe, um, maybe you're generous with your money, but not your time. Maybe you're like, here's a hundred bucks, get out of my face, okay? Maybe it's the other way around though. Maybe you have difficulty letting go of the finances, but I hope you move I'll hold babies for an hour on Sunday. I'll write cards to people who are sick. But listen, these middle schoolers need to get up out of my face. <laughs> they are strange, man. And I know I live with them, okay? I'm not saying that you gotta serve everywhere. That's not what I'm saying. What I am saying is you're called to be generous with yourself and not just the part that it's easy to be generous with. You're supposed to be generous with every part of yourself. Now, you can hear a sermon like this, and you can give it a shot for a minute, and I hope you will. I really do. I hope you will. But I'll tell you this right now. You can give it a shot for a minute, but it's not going to last without love. It won't. Love is what fuels generosity long term. Listen to me. I promise you this is true. If you don't love the people you're being generous with, eventually you'll resent them. If you don't love the people you're being generous with, eventually you will resent them. So I guess the real question is this. 
how do you how do you love people the way you're supposed to? How do you love people the way that, that God really meant for you to love them? Listen, the only way that, that I know to do it is to see them through the eyes of their father. To see them through the eyes of God. To understand that they, like you, were fearfully and wonderfully made by their father. That Jesus came and gave his life for them. That he loves them deeply that he loves them desperately, and he wants to spend eternity with them. That's true for them, and by the way, it's true for you as well. And if you have any questions about what I just said, please don't leave this place without coming and talking to me. I'll be down here in just a minute. I'd love to chat with you about it. If you don't want to come down front, you want to talk to me, that's okay. Find somebody that's got a name tag on. That means they're an elder of the church here or they're a staff member. We'd love to walk with you through this because we love you. And if you're not with us in the room right now, you're not physically present, you can email us at hello at swisscovechristian.com and I pray that you will. Hello at swisscovechristian.com. We love you and we wanna walk with you through this. Listen, church, we're just being honest with each other. We're not gonna like everybody to the same level, are we? There are some people that you like better than you like other people. That's okay. There are some people that you're going to connect with better, just naturally. You just click when you hang out. And you connect with them better than other people. That's okay. That's okay. But here's what we are going to do. Here's what we are going to do. We're going to take our time to be generous, to serve others inside the church and also outside the church in the community inside the church and outside the church. We're going to be known as a church who loves well, who gets this part right. We will love and therefore we will give sacrificially for other people. And we're not over here keeping score. We're not over here racking up points. Love is gonna lead the way. Our hearts set our heading. Anybody ever read any Bob Goff in here? Some Bob Goff people? If you have never read Bob Goff, do yourself a favor and pick up Love Does. Bob Goff, he said, um, he said, we might be known for our opinions, but we'll be remembered for our love. That's good, isn't it? We might be known for our opinions, but we'll be remembered for our love. I like that a lot, but I like this one even better. A new command I give you. Love one another as I have loved you. So you must love one another. This is Jesus speaking. By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples. If you what? If you love one another. Church, may our generosity overflow from the love that we have for other people. My prayer is that this world will be a different place because of the love that overflows from this place. My prayer is that God will be glorified and that disciples will be made because our love has overflowed into generosity that points people to Jesus. Let's pray together. Father, thank you so much for today. Thank you for the chance to be here and give you the glory that you so rightly deserve. God, help us. Help us to love well, to love other people the way that, that you love us. Thank you for demonstrating that love by sending Jesus to give his life for ours so that we could have the opportunity to be in a relationship with you. Father, we love you so much, and it's in Jesus' precious name that we pray. Amen.